HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. With more than 30 weekly podcasts, HRN has something for every food lover. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. Hi, and welcome to A Taste of the Past. I'm your host, Linda Palaccio. And my guest today is Nama Sheffi. Nama grew up in a kibbutz in Israel and later moved to New York City, where her work sits at the intersection of food, culture, community building, and art. In 2017, she founded the Jewish Food Society, a nonprofit organization which preserves and celebrates Jewish culinary heritage through a digital recipe archive and dynamic events. And in the summer of 2021, she launched ASIF, Culinary Institute of Israel a center in Tel Aviv dedicated to exploring the diverse and creative food culture of Israel, which garnered her a profile article in Vogue magazine. And now we've got the, we've got the society, we've got the Institute. Now we have the book. She has just published along with the Jewish food society, a brand new book, a lovely book called the Jewish holiday table, a world of recipes, traditions, and stories to celebrate all year long. And it will officially be released next week. That's March 12th, is it? March 13th of 2024. So depending on when you're listening, you'll know that it's out and you can order it and get it. Um, And I would like to welcome Nama. Welcome, Nama. (laughs) Hi, Linda. Thank you so much. So good to be here. Well, and great to have you. And it's it's interesting. I'm just I've been watching your progress, your developments, your your work for many years. Um, and you've always been a true fan and supporter, as well as well as a promoter, particularly a promoter of Israeli food. And I remember way back when, especially it was the restaurants of Tel Aviv. I remember your enthusiasm back in the day when you were, I think you were working at the consulate there and, and right. promoting things. Right. Mm-hmm. Were you always a real food enthusiast? Um, yes. You know, in many ways, the answer would be yes. Um I grew up on a small kibbutz in the center of the country. It's called Givata Shlosha. It was a pretty idyllic place to, you know, to to be as a child. We were walking barefoot for many hours, picking fruits from the trees. There were like lots of pomegranates and oranges. And, you know, it was just like a fun place to be. But (laughs) not everything was idyllic. We ate all of our meals in the communal dining room. So breakfast, lunch, and dinner together with 500 people. (laughs) So (laughs) so, um, now the community part was lovely, but the menu, less so. It was pretty bland, mostly Ashkenazi flavors. Um, Nothing to write home about. I'd imagine it was pretty repetitive too, feeding that many people. Exactly. So, you know, in a strange way, food became my, like, way to explore the life and culture and foods outside of the kibbutz. Now, Mm. what's interesting is that I grew up in the 80s. 
where you know we didn't have our own car it wasn't allowed it wasn't allowed to have any private you know ownership on anything so at a community we had 17 subaru cars and you really needed a good reason to get one like seeing a doctor going to a wedding or a funeral god forbid or something like that but I was very persistent. I was like begging for my parents to get us a car and to drive me to the Yemenite quarter in Tel Aviv or to the neighboring Arab um, village of Kfar Qasim and, and many other destinations. And luckily they supported this passion and um, always secured us, you know, a car. And mm-hmm. I think that was the beginning of my um in, you know, deep interest in food. You discovered a world of food out there, huh? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm. You know, it's it's interesting because it's. Um, and, and then you're you ended up going to re- leaving the school there and going to an art school, correct? Right. I mean that that was another eye opener. I'm sure you know for you for for sure you know as a kid from a kibbutz to land in the very bohemian like center of tel aviv and um just being exposed to all of this incredible Mm -hmm. culture um including food but back then it wasn't as exciting you know um but yeah um but it was definitely a journey well, then I started to see your name attached to articles that were, you know, written up in different magazines and e-zines. And, and I said, aha, uh-huh, she's gotten the bug into writing about food. <laughs> she's, she's there. Um, but you you really are, uh, I, well, I guess in politics, we call you a true community organizer. I mean, you really, you really have a knack for bringing people together and, and, you know, promoting food particularly, but this, you founded in 2017, you founded the Jewish food society. Can you tell me what, well, first of all, that, well, I have to say that I did cheat a little and I read the story in the book (laughs) that, that I think that I think is perhaps the catalyst or the, or was the spark for all of your projects possibly. And I wondered if you could share that story. It was about your husband's grandmother named Ketty. Totally, sure, um, with pleasure. So yes, yeah, so as as I mentioned before, I grew up on the kibbutz, so we didn't really celebrate Shabbat, or we celebrated, but in a very um, secular and repetitive way, again, in the communal dining room. So it was only when I met my husband in 2006 that I was invited to a Shabbat dinner. And He told me, you know, we were going to go to my grandmother, Ketty, and you were going to meet the entire family because every Shabbat, (laughs) every Friday night, she hosted the entire family of 25 people. So we landed in this tiny little one-bedroom apartment outside of Tel Aviv, like tiny place. And I thought to myself, "Hmm, how this? you know, woman is going to host 25 people here. And Ilan said, you'll see, it's like magic. And it was right. Slowly by slowly, they, you know, arrived and she found a space for everyone around the table. And wow. I, yeah, it, 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 it was, she was just like, you know, so warm and kind and she spoke Ladino and um, she started to cover the table with this, endless variety of salads and stuffed vegetables and meat and vegetable stews and like all sorts of delicious dishes. And I was just, you know, absolutely amazed by the flavors and by her generosity. But even more, I was just so curious and inspired by the stories behind each of these dishes. So Keti uh, was born in Izmir in Turkey, but before that 
the family originated in Spain. So there were Albondigas um, from that period. And from Izmir, the family moved to the island of Rhodes across the water in Greece. And from there to escape the Nazis, they moved to um, Rhodesia or current day Zimbabwe and from there to Israel. So every plate on that table represented a chunk of her journey. Mm. And I saw that it's it just, you know, incredible. And without even knowing it, she planted a seed for Jewish Food Society. Um, uh, I guess. I mean, it's, it's sort of <laughs> it really, I mean, what that table and, and your experience in, you know, discovering all those different foods really is a definition of the Jewish food society in a way. Um, that's, and that's beautiful. And so there 11 years later, you did that. Um, Thank tell you. us about the Jewish food society and what, what it really, what it is, what its mission is and, and what happens. Sure. So we are a nonprofit organization and we work to preserve and celebrate and kind of push forward the various um, culinary heritage from around the world and the history that attached to them. Mm-hmm. So we're building an online archive of Jewish family recipes and the stories that attach to them. And to bring this archive to life, we host all sorts of creative public programs and they can be, um, you know, educational panels or Passover seders or storytelling events, uh, all sorts of (laughs) crazy and um, out of the box um, events. Yeah. Even some, some cooking demonstrations and um, I've noticed, yeah, um, there too. Um, And you also have that interactive, um, portion where people, you encourage people to submit their recipes with their stories, correct? Exactly. So what, it was very clear to me from the very beginning that, um, you know, in order to preserve a cuisine, you simply need to cook it and you can be, you know, from, you know, you can be the cook or you, you can be the person who crave that dish Mm -hmm. but um i think that that's really important because many of these dishes would be you know would just disappear and what i learned from katie is that by the way the next day after this shabbat dinner that happened on friday night um i went back to katie and i was just you know i sat down with her and i started to write the recipes and to plan a cooking session with her where I could witness and learn um, her secrets Mm. (laughs) or recipes. Because, you know, for many cooks, even if you get um, a written recipe, it would be, you know, a cup. It's not like a measuring cup. It would be a cup. (laughs) A little (laughs) bit of this and a little bit of that. So um, when we started the Jewish Food Society, we started to, when possible, we started to cook with people in their own kitchens. And the reason for that was exactly to capture this knowledge um, firsthand, because there are just so many um, aspects of you know, cooking a dish and so, so many methods. So it was important for us when possible to spend time in the kitchen with the person and then to go back to the test kitchen and to make sense of the recipe and to develop it and to make sure that it's written in the best way possible. So this is one part of that. And the other part is really about the oral history and about the story, because we found that when we actually put in the time and spend time in someone's home, there is just more chances that this person will then trust us and open up and share more details about their story. Because many times when you pick up the phone and just do like, you know, a, a cold interview, we just found that it's just not so fruitful. 
Mm-hmm. But when you cook with someone, um, it's such an intimate act. So people tend to, you know, just to be more open. And also when you are at the home, we could then ask to see some artifacts and people will then bring on some objects and old photos and you just get you get more details into yeah. the story that we're trying to compose. The stories really start to flow. I mean, I've always believed that the kitchen is a great equalizer. And Absolutely. And I think you have mentioned in one of your articles or perhaps the book that uh, through the food and the recipes, people find are finding acceptance and connection through food. I mean, and that's, I mean, how do you know about a culture first, you know, is often is through the food and that, exactly. you, know, you can taste, you taste the culture. I mean, there is one um, story in that book that I feel that it's, you know, I mean, there are many stories that Mm -hmm. speak exactly about this point, but I'm thinking about a story um, from Yonit Naftali, who is a a writer who is based in Tel Aviv. And she shared with us her family recipe for the holiday of Purim, which, you know, it's it's coming up. very quickly and um, I'll try to you know to summarize the story but basically her um, grandmother was one of 10 siblings and only four of them survived the holocaust survived Auschwitz so after the war her mom's recipes were the only things that she had and so for your needs, mom, these recipes were everything. And religiously, she made them for every holiday and she didn't change a thing. She followed the recipe directly. So even for, you know, for Purim, the family made um, a fluten cake and then another pastry called Biali, Bigly, which is, you know, with um, poppy seeds and mm-hmm. with um, with nuts, and she would always, you know, grind the nuts by hand. And the interesting story here is that as a child in Israel, you need to task with bringing these cakes as part of a mishloach manot. Mishloach manot is a custom in Purim where you bring baked goods and other sweets and sometimes wine to your neighbors and friends. So as a kid, she would carry, you know, these, the, a plate with, with her mom's Hungarian cakes to the neighbors. And she shared with us that for many years, she was actually embarrassed on doing that because all of her friends were from Moroccan background and she felt like, a foreigner bringing these European Hungarian pastries. But she said that one day um, one neighbor came in and brought the plate back and she said, you know, I am waiting for your specific Mishlach Manot for these cakes all year long. I adore <laughs> these cakes. And your Nick said that it was that very moment that her embarrassment changed to pride. So mm. I find it so powerful that someone can, you know, like a journey from loneliness and grief to acceptance and embrace and all of that through food. Right. And she was living in Morocco at the time, or she was Moroccan, I forget, but she was... No, so she she lived in a town in Israel where many of her members were from Morocco, but her uh, background was um, Hungarian. Uh-huh. So, um, yeah. yeah, there were so many stories. I read I read yeah. just about all of them, and I did read hers, and I really I really did enjoy it. And and I found that, but that's with all of the the recipes. Some of the recipes aren't necessarily, I mean, to me as as a cook, you know, not, not necessarily new. But I found them compelling because the stories were so compelling, were so interesting, just as you mentioned. You know, they were, you know, they, they make you want to try that dish just 
because of the story, if nothing else. And, and of course, the recipes are very good as well. But how did you choose which recipes to include? I mean, sure, you must have had so many. Right. Um, it was a long process, but I totally agree with you. And I would also love to quote a friend of mine, Mitchell Davis, that one said in one of our events at the beginning of when we started, he said, food without a story is just calories. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I can't agree more. So when mm-hmm. we search what kind of recipes um, um, to feature, it was equally important to us that the recipes would be delicious, but also that the story behind them would be compelling and interesting. So that was like, you know, the first condition. And then the other was really about um, showing this incredible diversity about Jewish food. So Mm -hmm. it was important for us to showcase, you know, just less known traditions. Yeah, that's that's really what I wanted to go to um, was the diversity that exists within the Jewish cuisine, um, and it, you said you know, the diaspora is sprawling and multicultural, and so is now the definition of Jewish food, right? Exactly, and again, I think that when often time when people in America think about Jewish food, they think about a very narrow and specific representation of Jewish mm-hmm. food, with which many times it would be Ashkenazi Jewish food and specifically an American version of um, some Ashkenazi Jewish food. So they think about bagel and lax and deli food and chopped liver and matzo ball, but really they, you know, they're like just so many communities there is a community that moved from iraq to india starting in the 18th century and now um, they are based in london there is another family that moved from morocco to brazil in the 19th century so they're just like this incredible diversity and you know wherever jewish people lived all around the world they created um, these micro cuisines that were a result of the laws of Kashrut and Jewish holidays and keeping the Shabbat in constant negotiation with the local food tradition. So mm-hmm. the result is like these very multi layered um, dishes. And I just find it, you know, fascinating and oftentimes delicious too. Yeah. Oh, it's just, you know, it's just wonderful to to read about them. And everyone seems to uh, be enjoying the sharing process as well as as they tell the stories. And and so that kind of translates into the recipes too, that, you know, it's it's a fun thing, that wonderful thing that they're sharing. Um, And... uh, in the the the, uh, the Jewish Food Society, you have these archives of recipes, as you mentioned. Do you have an idea of like what how large the archive is at this time? Sure. At, at this point, is like we're talking about thousands of um, mm. recipes, and again, the histories that are attached to them, and, and we have a very um, thorough and um, you know long process when once we feature um, a family. Mm. So as, as I mentioned before, when we, when possible, we cook with people in their homes, but when it's not possible, because we're talking about communities and, you know, um, sources from all around the world, then we conduct a cooking session via Zoom and, and interviews just, you know, uh, via WhatsApp or Zoom. And then we bring the recipes to the test kitchen and we try to stay as, you know, true as possible to, to the origin. But sometimes we would make some adjustment to cater to more modern times. Um, so that's the culinary side. And, and we always um, present an essay 
that um, describe the you know the the story of the family and their journey. Yeah. And what I find to be very interesting is that in most cases, we always mention on the archive the origin. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes you'll see a, a multi-location origin. So for example, it could be, you know, starting the Ukraine through Mexico City to Brooklyn, New York. Right. So right. <laughs> you follow you yeah. and, you, and you did put that in the book as well, which I found I I would immediately look down to the bottom to see, you know, what was their journey, where, you know, what where did the family begin and, and where did where all did they go and where did they end up? And I will say that the Jewish food societies, I'm on the mailing list, so I get all of your postings and all your <laughs> announcements. And, oh, nice. <laughs> anyone who, and, and they are all, I have to just say that the, the photographs are wonderful and, the, and everything is so delicious. Every time I look at them, I say, ah, I can't look at this now. I'll get too hungry. But <laughs> um, and, and the website as well is, is just very, everything is done very, you know, uh, very well and very, and very beautiful. Yeah. I encourage people to take a look at that. It's jewishfoodsociety.org. And I want to talk about one of your other projects, um, recent projects too, but we have to take a, a quick break. So stay with us and we'll come back after a quick break. Hi, we're back, and I'm speaking with Nama Sheffi, and she is the founder and executive director of the Jewish Food Society dot org, and a brand new book that's out called The Jewish Holiday Table. And Nama, you also started uh, a new project, a new institute, the right. Asif Culinary Institute of Israel. Would you tell me about that? That that's that was just a real I watched the the development of that too, and it's just a real surprise to me, and, and a wonderful, a beautiful looking place. Yes, thank you, Linda. Um, yeah, so Asif is a nonprofit organization and a culinary center in the heart of Tel Aviv, and it really dedicated to cultivating and nurturing um, the very diverse and creative food culture of Israel. And at the beginning, you know, one of our supporters here in New York um, came up with the idea to to bring Jewish Food Society to Israel and do something similar. And I was very interested in that. But my response was that um, it should be something else in Israel because Israel is not just Jewish and it is... Um, 20% uh, population of Arab Israelis. So um, I saw that it should be a place that celebrates all of this incredible diversity that is Israel. Mm. And, um, you know, the word asif in Hebrew means harvest, like that's the direct um, translation, Mm -hmm. but it also means asif amim, um, gathering of people. So at the place, it's it's a really beautiful building and we have a few sections to, you know, to the center. So we have an art gallery with food-related um, exhibitions that we rotate um, every couple of months. We have a culinary library, which is, which has the lar- largest collection of culinary titles, um, and it's free and open to the public. Then we have a little all-day cafe and a provision shop where people can get, you know, incredible olive oils and wines and other goods from small producers. Um, and a vertical farm on the roof of the building. Hmm. And so it's a very dynamic place. You know, we host all sorts of public um, programs for the professional 
community and mm-hmm. just for people who are interested in food. Well, I know you've you've mentioned that it's an intersection of heritage and tradition with creativity and innovation because you are looking at a lot of new. Well, you said you have the the vertical farm on the roof, um, uh, but you're looking at new new methods for foods and 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 farms and things. Um, when you opened this during in the middle of was it in the middle of the the pandemic? Correct. Wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And, um, and now I, you're going through difficult times again. I mean, it's just you know, it's um, I'm sure that Tel Aviv is is constantly in sort of a you know a bit of unrest there. So yes, um, these are indeed very sad, devastating um, times for everyone Mm -hmm. who is connected to this place, uh, me included, and my team. Um, But we are just trying to do everything we can to support people in need. So very quickly after October 7th, the team um, kind of repurpose the kitchen and the test kitchen and every you know area we had and start um, to cook meals to um, displaced families and to elderly um, Holocaust survivors and, and other people who weren't able to leave their home. And we delivered um, thousands and thousands um, of meals. So that was um, kind of an immediate reaction. And since then, we've been doing um, other things. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know that you, that's, I mean, it's, you know, with a library and a kitchen and a, a, you know, a small farm up there, you've got a lot of uh, things at your disposal. Um, you also produced a magazine, um, representing the work right. of, uh, right? Yes. So the website is available in three languages in Hebrew, um, in Arabic and in English. And, you know, I, I'm really so proud of the team who is that really, so you know this, the research is so serious, and it explored how food relates to history and culture and politics and fashion and gender. And at one point, we just thought that um, it would make sense to really bring together selects of all of these um, stories and articles. And, and invest in a print magazine. So um, we, we, we just um, do once a year. So up until now, we publish two of these. Um, and um, the next one will probably be much different because, again, we're in times of war mm-hmm. and um, it, everything is obviously just... Um, you know, we experience everything through through this land. All right, and I mean, it's I mean, it, the the institute, the culinary institute, is is representing the food of Israel and all the different cultural influences happening there. Which, right. as we've already talked about, even in just you know, and um, with the Jewish Food Society, that's many. Well, so in Israel, it you know, even more. And I know that you were accused by a Palestinian editor at an Israeli newspaper about uh, um, about cultural and culinary appropriation, which seems to be, you know, the you know, the the uh, method of many people these days wanting yeah. to, you know, protect things. But um, I mean, that's that was inevitable. It seems. I, I mean, I think what what we are trying to do at ASIF is exactly to study and to honor all influences on, you know, on Israeli food culture, 
including Palestinian influences. Um, my hope that Asif would be a place for people to meet and to argue and um, to share food and to talk about food. And that's all we can do. I, I honestly can't think of, <laughs> of another way mm. at this moment before the war and during the war and hopefully after when um, we all have peace, um, I hope. Well, as I said, the kitchen and food is often the great equalizer, but, you know, it's going to take some work, uh, you know, it, and I applaud sure. your, I, I do applaud your efforts and, you know, who knew when you were, you know, <laughs> planning this and, and forming this and, and, you know, even opening it that what would, what the world would be today. It's, you know, it's difficult, I know. but the book, the book is, is, you know, the book is a beauty and, Back to, is it published mm -hmm. only in English at this time, the book? Yes, only uh -huh. in English. Um, the Jewish Holiday Table, a world of recipes, traditions, and stories to celebrate all year long. And, it, you know, it's just it's just sort of an uplifting book to open and look at when all else seems doom and gloom. And uh, and I, I, again, applaud you and the or and the food society for that um, i just wanted to also give the the web address of asif it's it's a s i f dot org correct correct yes okay correct and i think that um i just encourage people to look at it and, and we on the outside try to understand a little more and if we can do it through food that is definitely one way in and uh and I, for one, am a great believer in in food bringing us together. So, I hope that I hope that your efforts will 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 prove right in that direction as well. And and congratulations on the book. And I can't wait to you know to have it you know be all over the shelves. It should be coming out. What does it come out next week? Early next week? Yes, uh, March twelfth. Okay. Yes. All right. <laughs> Well, it's it's a delight to talk to you too, and and you are, as I say, one busy lady. And I, I can't believe all the things that you've managed to accomplish in the short years, you know, ten nine years that when I first met you. It's just amazing, really amazing. Oh. And and thank I, you so much, Linda. I really really appreciate our <laughs> conversation today. Uh, and I want you to keep up the good work uh, because you deserve it. And and I uh, hope the book is a great success. So thank you. And thank you for tuning in to A Taste of the Past. And I'd like to thank my engineer, Liam Werner, and HeritageRadioNetwork.org for making this broadcast possible. Tune in to HeritageRadioNetwork.org to find out all of the wonderful shows that are you can listen to, podcasts that you can listen to on the website and wherever else you tune in to get your podcasts. Ah, and I forgot to mention too, that Schmaltzy, the podcast for All the right. Jewish Food Society, we totally forgot to mention that. Okay. Well, there, we get <laughs> it at the end. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Nama. Bye-bye. A Taste of the Past is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network. Food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org/slash subscribe 